When Laura and I first got married, you know, she did her best to introduce me to her entire family. And she has a quite a large extended family. But there was a group in particular she really wanted me to get to know, and that was her cousins, who she is very close to. There's probably over 60 uh, cousins that she, you know, she wanted me to get to know. And you know, like any other person coming into this family, I wanted to make a good impression. But there was one cousin in particular that I really wanted to impress. The difficult thing was, is that this cousin in particular was really into hiking. But let me make this very clear. I don't like hiking at all, but I still wanted to make a great impression. So I told this cousin, Let's name him Sam. I told him that, hey, I'm willing to go on a hike with you, but you need to take it easy on me. And so Sam promised me that he would pick a hike um, that was going to be like a beginner's one. And so Sam ended up choosing a hike that was about 3.5 hours long, one way uphill. So in total, the hike was going to be about seven hours. The truth was, there was no time to enjoy the scenery. I was just trying to survive. I was just trying to get one foot in front of the other. And then he even dared to offer me some trail mix. And I'm thinking to myself, hey, if there's no bacon in that trail mix, I don't want it because nothing's going to help me. And we finally, we finally get to the top. Sam and myself and a few others, we finally get there. And it's supposed to be this magnificent scene. And we get there. And as I'm about to sit down to heal my broken body, Sam goes, it's time to go down now. And there we go, back down. And so why is it? Why is it that every time that when hikers hike and you start to, as you go down and people go up, people will always ask the question of, oh, how much longer is it you know, before we get to the top? Or they'll ask, hey, for those of you coming down, was it worth it? All that trouble to get to the top? Hikers will then like sort of um, twist the truth a little. You know, they'll twist the truth and, and they'll give you this false hope. Not that you tell people, oh, it's not that much longer to the top, even though there's probably about three hours to go, or it's worth it when really you're unsure. The questions I ask myself from time to time, especially in regards to that hike with Sam, is was it worth it? Or did I gain anything? Let me tell you what I did gain. I gained intelligence. I now know I would never do that again. But the truth is, I actually gained a really good relationship with Sam. It didn't come instantly. It didn't even come when the hike ended, but it came eventually, years down the road, because we had shared not just that, that experience, but other experiences as well. Look, this is the question asked and answered in this part of the book of Malachi, now that we're close to the end. So let me read for us Malachi chapter 3, verses 13, all the way to chapter 4, verses 3. And it says this. You have spoken arrogantly against me, says the Lord. Yet you ask, what have we said against you? You have said, it is futile to serve God that what we, do, what we do gain by carrying out his requirements and going about the, about the mourners before the Lord Almighty, but now we call the arrogant blessed. Certainly evildoers prosper, and even when, th even when they put God to the test, they get away with it. Then those who fear the Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honoured his name. On the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty, they will be my treasured possession. I will spare them just as a father has compassion and spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between righteous and the wicked 
between those who serve God and those who do not. Surely the day is coming and it will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and and every evildoer will be stubble. And the day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or branch will be left to them. But for you who revere my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays. And you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. Then you will trample on the wicked and they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty. There are just two things I want to point out, especially in regards to what we just read. And the two things are, first thing is, serving is a seed. Okay, so serving is a seed. The second thing is, fear is a factor. So let's go for the first point. Serving is a seed. When you look at verse 13, it says, you, that means those who were there at the time speaking about God, you have spoken arrogantly against me. That's the charge. So just like other previous passages of Malachi, God brings up this accusation that the people have made. Then the accusation is that the people have spoken uh, arrogantly or in other translations, they would use the word harsh. So God says, you have spoken like harsh words against me. So God, God's people respond with in the very same verse, in verse 13, well, like, what have we said? What are you talking about? And but God reveals to them in the next two verses, in verses 14 and 15, and proves to them, well, these are the harsh words or the arrogant words that you've said. It's like that TV show, Border Security. If you don't know what it's about, it's basically, you know, one of those sort of live shows where a camera follows customs officers. And they follow customs officers around as they go around doing their job protecting our border here in Canada. Don't we love it when those um, customs officers ask the passengers, especially those passengers coming off those planes, and they ask them, hey, do you have anything in your bags if I check it or anything on your body if I check it that you are hiding or that you need to declare or you haven't declared? And the passengers usually respond by saying there's no, I've got nothing to declare. There's nothing on me or in my bags that I should declare. And almost every time in the show of border security, nearly every time the customs officer will pull out something from the bag. It will either be like a piece of fruit or a weapon, a gun, a knife, whatever it is. And they'll pull it out and they'll show it to the, to the passenger and say, what's this? The customs officer will then proceed to show the passengers their declaration card. It's a card that points out, hey, you signed this you know, declaration card to say that you had nothing and here I have found something. And you've ticked on the declaration card that you had no fruit and yet here it is. And most of the time the passengers will be like, oops, or I guess I forgot. And this is what God is doing. God is showing his people that all throughout the book of Malachi, that he knows their intentions. And there is nothing hidden from his sight so that we can be honest with him because he already knows. But in verses 14 to 15 in chapter 3, God reveals them. But this is, this is the accusation that you've made. These are the harsh words, the arrogant words. God then proceeds to repeat to them. And this is what he says to them. This is the things that you've said. So there's three things that they say. And the three things they say is this. First, in verses 14 and 50, they say, serving sucks. Second, worship is worthless. And then thirdly, wickedness wins. So serving sucks, worship is worthless, and wickedness wins. Let's go to the first point, the first accusation, which is serving sucks. Part of their cry to God here in chapter 3, verses 14 to 15 is, is, what's the point of serving God? 
What's the point of serving his church? I serve him, yet God doesn't come down and thank me personally. The people that I serve seem so ungrateful, and all they do is complain every single time. You know, it's not easy to come here and serve because it means I have to be here before everyone else and I have to stay back, stay back like later than everyone else. We don't seem to get anything out of, out of this. But if I serve myself, like, you know, getting a new iPhone, well, at least I get instant gratification. One of the things that Laura and I do uh, with our kids every single year is that we like go through their closets. We go through everything and we kind of put into bags things that they either no longer play with or they, you know, no longer wear. And we put them in a bag and then we give them away. It's a part of a, like a yearly routine that the whole family goes through at my household. Have there been tears, especially in regards to clothes and toys, when we are giving them away and putting them in the bag? Of course. But we also teach them that there are others that are in need and others that want some of the things that they have. And so we donate them together as a family. But the truth is, as a parent, I have no idea if they understand what we are trying to teach them. But one day they will. See, serving a God that serves us doesn't sort of always make sense. and can be really difficult within the moment. But as Galatians chapter 5 verse 13 encourages us, it, can, it, it encourages us to sort of use our freedom that we have in Jesus to not indulge in the flesh, to not get that instant gratification, but use the freedom that God has given us to actually serve one another. And then one day, God will make sense of it all. The second point, or the second accusation that the people make to God is, Worship is worthless. The terms that they use here that, you know, God brings up to them is this idea of carrying out and mourners. That's what they're complaining about in regards to their worship of God. See, carrying out, you know, in verse 14, carrying out, in other words, is the idea of being obedient to God. Okay, so, but what they're saying is being obedient to God produces no profit. Everyone else there, out there, seems to like disobey God and nothing happens. Or mourners, or in other words, those who sort of grieve their sin. But those who grieve their sin seem to produce nothing. And all day we see others out there enjoy their sin and what do we gain by being obedient and by grieving this reward system this is their complaint this reward system that God has created should be more like how the world works you know how the world works you do good you get good so why is it so hard for God to understand that that might be a better system Jesus tells uh, a story to Christians in Luke chapter 15. You may know the story as the prodigal son or the two lost sons or the prodigal God. The story goes that the, the younger brother, he, uh, he leaves the family and goes off to this sort of faraway land and he spends all his money, all his inheritance on prostitutes, on this, this idea of wild living, crazy living. He does exactly what he wants with his body and mind. Anything he desired, he went and did it. But the other brother, the older brother, on the other hand, he stays home with the father. 
And he remains there, obedient. The younger brother, actually one day he, like, he comes to his senses and he realizes and he mourns and he returns home. The father is beyond joyful. And the father puts on a, a party, like a, a celebration for this child, this younger son is, that is coming home. As this happens, I will pick up the story starting from, you know, uh, Luke chapter 15, verses 25 to 31. So in Luke chapter 15, verses 25 to 31, it says this as I pick up the story. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him? My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. So what do we gain by obedient, by being obedient to God and grieving our sins? With that passage we just read in Luke 15, the thing that we actually gain is God. That's what he's telling his older son. You have me. You're with me all the time. Everything I have is yours. In Jesus, we have all that we need. That's why in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, it reminds us of this, that in Christ we have everything. But those on their deathbed, they do not look back. None of them look back and think to themselves, oh, I wish I made more money. Or I, had, I wish I spent more time working. The usual talk about that time is actually about, man, I wish I spent more time with the ones that I love. Part of the good news is that we have a God that delights to spend time with us. Not just for now, but for all of eternity. The next charge, the next sort of harsh words that the people have for God is, that wickedness wins. So the thing, the charge that they bring towards God is, why are evildoers going great? Why, why, why is everything about it great? Because it looks like they're having the time of their lives. And our attitude can be, oh, if you can't beat them, let's just join, let's join them. However, God goes on to promise in Malachi chapter 3, verse 18, all the way to chapter 4, verse 3, that the day is coming. And when he will act, when he does his thing, he's going to make a distinction between good and evil, like separating oil from water. He's going to separate it. What follows is God makes it very graphic. For instance, if you look at Malachi chapter, chapter 4, verse 1, you see that he uses the word when he acts that there will be stubble. Stubble is, is used and how that stubble will be set on fire. That's the language God uses in Malachi chapter 4 verse 1. You know, growing up in Australia, there were, you know, there were bushfires every year. Some years were like really bad and some not so much but it was still the norm to have one every year. 
But the bushfires were always dependent on what was happening previously. It was dependent on the build-up, the actual build-up of all the sort of the dead leaves and the dead trees and branches. See, the more dead leaves and the more dead trees and branches, then the worse the fire would be the very next year. That's the idea is that the stubble is the build-up of these dead leaves and trees. And then God will come in in his time and will deal with that stubble. But many will cry out to God. You and I might be crying out to God and asking for his judgment now. God, just come back now and just judge the world. Let's just end it. It just seems like right, right now life is all unfair. They're sinning and going about their way and I'm trying not to and things, you know, I'm suffering here. But if you come in and judge, Lord God, then, you know, somehow you will balance the scales into our favor. But my question for us is, are you sure that you want God and his judgment to come right now? See, passages like Malachi, they can be a good thing. They're like a, a warning sign, like there's danger ahead. And it gives you that time to reassess and to sort of act carefully. But there are other passages that are similar to this. They give a warning, but they also reveal God's character. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 to 9, there's a couple of things that is said here. And it says this in 2 Peter Chapter 3, verses 8 to 9 says, But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Look, God may not be doing what we want him to do in our time. But as each day, you know, sort of goes by, let us do what was just read, which is our part of our job is to proclaim the patience and love of God and call people to mourn for their sin. The second point is, first of all, that, you know, serving is a seed, but also now the second point is that fear is a factor. See, back in chapter 3, verse 16, it actually says that in, in the very first word that Malachi uses is the word then. The word then is sort of this, this new point in the story, the new point in the narrative. The author is making a now ma- a distinction between those who previously do not fear God to now those who fear God. Okay, so this is the turn, part of the turn in the story. We are told in Malachi chapter 3 verse 16 that the God-fearers, what happens? They come together and they talk. They're in a discussion, in a conversation now. And the strange thing is, is that we have no idea what's being said. Doesn't that seem a little odd to you? It's odd because previously, all the way from chapter 1 to all the way to chapter 3, all throughout the book of Malachi, God has revealed every conversation and every action of those who do not fear God. But when we get to the God-fearers, Silence. Why? You see that all previous conversations were God revealing what was deep inside the hearts of those who do not fear him. But for those who fear God, the truth is it does not matter what they say but rather what is in their hearts and what is in their hearts is 
the fear of God. That's what it's revealing here. You know, I'm not a fearful person, but there have been like uh, moments in my life where I've been overwhelmed with fear. When I was a younger man, um, there were many times where I had to actually, as a criminal, I had to stand before a, a judge, especially for all those crimes I had committed. There was actually great fear within me because, you know, the judge that I stood before held sort of my life in his hands. And he would be just in any decision that he made about me. And I would actually have to accept what he said. Like I would have to accept his judgment. As God fearers, we stand before God the judge. And it does not matter what we say about him. Just like in that verse 16 there. It actually matters more about what God says about us. For those who fear him. And that's what happens in chapter 3, verse 17. So there's silence from the God-fearers, but then it is God who speaks and says something. And what does God say to those who fear him? God calls them his treasured possession. So what does God mean when he calls them? When he calls those who fear him, his treasured possession. Imagine that I was uh, leading us into war. And uh, I was the king, the general, the leader, whatever it is, the instigator, the troublemaker, whatever we want to call it. And we were going to go and conquer a city, right? Because Abbotsford is not enough. I want more. So let me randomly pick a city that we can go and conquer. So I lead us to go and conquer the city of Chicago. We are eventually victorious and the entire city of Chicago is now ours. But me being the king or the leader in this analogy, you know, gets a, I get a special treasure even though all of Chicago is mine because I'm leading the charge and I'm given, you know, a treasured possession. That treasured possession, the one that I want, is the Michael Jordan statue in front of the United Center. See, that's what's happening. That's the idea of treasured possession. Back in Malachi's time, it would be the idea of that as a nation conquers another nation, the king, the leader, he gets a treasured piece, the most precious piece, when they conquer another nation. Though the whole earth belongs to God, and he's conquered it all, God saves for himself a treasured possession. God saves for himself those who fear him. I just want to simply conclude with Romans chapter 8, verses 31 to 39, to remind us of what God has done. So in Romans chapter 8, verses 31 to 39, it says this. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died... More than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship 
or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to the slaughtered. No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So church, let us actually encourage one another, especially towards love and good works, because the day of the Lord is approaching. It's coming soon. Then we will see that we have gained Christ. Let's pray. Jesus, we want to thank you for what you have done. We want to thank you that you came to serve us. Knowing that when we try to serve, we actually end up just serving ourselves. And it came to nothing. And so, Jesus, we are so thankful for what you did on the cross, that you have created for yourself a treasured possession. So, Lord Jesus, continue to help us to know what it means to fear you, to know you, and to walk humbly before you. And so, Jesus, we would continue to ask, that as the days and the months and the years seem tedious and hard and difficult, would you remind us that every single day we continue to gain more of you? And it is you and only you that we need. So Jesus, give us more of yourself. Reveal more of yourself by your word. And we give you great thanks, Jesus. In your great name we pray. Amen.